Okay, we're starting now. Uh, welcome to another episode of the uh, Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Barlin. Uh, today we have a very uh, interesting guest, uh, someone who's been involved in LDS apologetics for a number of years. Um, but before we uh, get to him and his uh, topic, just in terms of announcements, we have a number of uh, episodes in um, scheduled. For instance, tomorrow week, the 3rd of July, I will have both Craig Foster and Brian Hales on to discuss Mormon fundamentalism and polygamy and other fun topics. So be sure to uh, look out for that. Uh, there's a lot of contemporary currency with this one because there's a new TV series on Mormon fundamentalism and Warren Jeffs. And of course, the whole Warren Jeffs is just simply Joseph Smith in the modern era shtick comes up quite a bit in memes and other media. So I thought, you know, why not have a uh, show specifically on that particular topic. Both Craig and Brian are experts in the field, so uh, we will have two of the best on this. There's other episodes as well and other guests. Uh, hopefully I'll have Nathaniel Givens on in the near future and maybe even Terrell, his father, and a couple of others as well. Um, I've emailed recently Russell Stevenson and D. Charles Pyle um, to come on and discuss uh, various topics as well, so um, hopefully I'll hear back from them soon as well. Uh, there's a number of announcements, but I'll keep this short. Um, as I said, we have a very interesting guest today, and unless you've been living under a rock for like the last 25 plus years, uh, if you've been involved in LDS apologetics in any way, you've seen his stuff. Um, as I told Jeff just a few minutes ago, he's is the very first pro LDS apologetics website I came across in late 2001 when I started studying the church. Um, he's LDS FAC now, uh, Mormon Answers page. It's none other than Jeff Lindsay. Um, so, uh, Jeff, um, thanks for coming on. I greatly appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, also want to, well, I also want to say people ought to pay attention to, to, your, to your work because you come up with just some amazing finds involving uh, theology and the history of Christianity and relation, philosophical relationships between early Christianity and LDS teachings. And uh, you're, you're always coming up with great insights. So it's a pleasure to, to talk with you. I gr thank you. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, for those who may, as I said, may be living under a rock for the last 20 plus years, um, you know, when Elias apologetics, uh, for those who may never have heard of you for whatever reason, could you like give a brief uh, overview of who you are? Like, have you always been LDS? Uh, what do you do for a living? What got you involved in LDS studies? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so forth. Sure. Um, yeah, I grew up in the church, um, in Salt Lake City and Boise, Idaho and Portland, Oregon. And around in the Intermountain West. Um, went on a mission to Switzerland, but it was really when I was a teenager when I started realizing, hey, this, this church asked some pretty tough things from people, and if it's not true, uh, I really wanted to find out for myself, and I, I really did go on my own investigation. How can I figure out if this is really worth it, if I want to make those kind of sacrifices, and decided uh, Book of Mormon was the key, and read it through fast as I could, got down and prayed, and nothing happened and then i went back and thought about what what i'd gone through and the, the promise in Moroni 10 4 and realized oh you know i really hadn't done much intellectual engagement just kind of thinking it would all pop out at the end and so i went back and read it more meticulously and pondered it and um, had a very very different experience that time and it really set me on a path that i am very grateful to still be on of one of amazing gratitude or gratitude for the amazing blessings we have in the gospel for the answers it gives us uh, the the things that helps us think about the problems that helps us avoid and the many witnesses and evidences of something far beyond what the other side has been letting us know or telling us there, there are people that really want to keep us in the dark i mean are the adversary wants to keep us in the dark and there's so much light well, this is a great time to be a member of the church in spite of all the challenges and pains that people feel and face it is it is the best time and the church is truer than ever has better answers than people can, can imagine and the book of mormon to me is a real foundation of all of that i'm continually impressed with how much is in there for our day in this age and so yeah the answer is yes i've been a member of the church for, for throughout my life i'm very grateful to for that I served a mission in switzerland zurich switzerland german speaking and uh, went into chemical engineering and got a PhD in chemical engineering, was in academia for a number of years, then joined a um, large American corporation um, doing R&D and then got involved with intellectual property and patents, kind of had a career change that really excited me. So I've been doing intellectual property strategy and they even the company, uh, Kimberly Clark, created a nice position for me called corporate patent strategist where I was working with people all over the company, company on patent strategy. 
So kind of combining you know, academic background and my own R&D experience with IP law and IP strategies, kind of been what I've been doing since then. Um, after Kimberly Clark was with a consultant, consultancy firm for a number of years, helping some of the world's largest and smallest companies with their IP strategy and technology scouting. And then China came knocking, had a wonderful chance to go spend nine years in China working with a very large company, Asia Pulp and Paper, and doing, uh, running their uh, intellectual property program. And after COVID, uh, COVID came after I'd already joined a startup company back in the US. Um, so instead of working remotely from China, started working in the United States, and then that has transitioned into a number of other things. So I've been doing, continuing to do intellectual property strategy for some great clients and um, other changes are on the way, but it's been a, been a very fun career. Now living in Wisconsin, Appleton, Wisconsin, where we've raised most of our children, I've raised all of them to some degree here, uh, four sons, they're all married, and we have 13 grandchildren, and it's a tremendous experience being, being a grandparent. Um, there's a quick summary. My wife is Kendra Lindsay, and she is uh, her background is in statistics, master's degree in statistics, also at BYU, but uh, has has kind of stepped aside from her career prospects to uh, for our, our family as we have been raising raising the, those boys and. Now she's very busy as a grandmother, but she teaches professionally. Uh, she founded the, uh, so when I say stepped away, she stepped away from statistics for a number of years, but she's been very, very active in the community. She actually founded uh, probably the most successful charter school in, in Wisconsin, arguably, and certainly in this area, uh, called the Classical School, that uh, has just transformed life, life for hundreds of kids that focuses on really solid academics, foreign language, real math, phonics, strong approaches to reading, history, uh, very, very solid uh, curriculum that covers what kids really need to know. And it's helped them succeed when they go on to college and uh, there's a huge waiting list to get in. A uh, wonderfully successful school that, that she founded, was on the board of directors, was a teacher before we went to China. And I'm uh, very proud of her for that. And uh, that's been one of the real highlights of our, of our marriage is watching her unfold in that role and having that amazing experience with impact on many people in the community. Um, so and now, now we are working with the grandkids and others. Our current calling, we have a dream calling. We've been called as ministering, ministering specialist in the Appleton, Wisconsin stake, working especially with the African community here. We have a lot of wonderful people that have fled from war and chaos in the eastern part of Africa, Congo, uh, Burundi, Rwanda especially, and many of them have come here to this area. And I'm very proud of our, this community and what they've done to help our, our, our friends from Africa and many people coming here. And we get to work with a number of them and learn some of their stories and see the, the huge differences, uh, the, the, the challenges that they face when they come here and some of the big differences between their way of life and what they see here. And, you know, it's been a wonderful journey. We're really fun calling to have. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Um, a lot of fun here in Wisconsin. That's cool. Uh, and that sounds like a very interesting uh, calling. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, interesting stories to share and so forth. Um, and of course, like you do run a very popular website. Uh, it used to be known as LDS FAQ, now Mormon Answers. I'll be linking to that on your Jeff Lindsay website. Um, you've also published a number of very interesting papers with the Interpreter Foundation on the Book of Abraham, the Arabian Peninsula Geography of the Book of Mormon, and also a uh, tree on the which I'm sure we'll be top, uh, touching upon the topic uh, you'll be discussing today on a rise from the uh, dust um, motif. Um, and of course, like you have a, um, used to run a Mormonity blog, but I believe the name has been changed. Could you tell us briefly about that? Yeah, 2004, I started blogging about the church, um, kind of uh, defending things uh, on, the, on, on the online. And the name of that, the name I picked was Mormonity. And, um, you know, recently with the church's emphasis on let's don't confuse people about the name of the church, my granddaughter, and now is now 15, about to turn 16, um, said, you know, mom, asked her mom, hey, well, how come grandpa is still using that Mormonity name? Shouldn't he be changing it? 
And that one question made me realize, oh, yeah, you know what? She's got a point. So I thanked her the other day because I'm actually pretty happy with, with her, her suggestion that I finally listened to it. Well, the prophet's suggestion, I guess I should say. Um, so I, I decided to find a different name. But it was a lot more challenging than I thought because uh, I wanted to export it to a domain name. And I found a d domain name that I liked. But uh, the, the export function at uh, Google's I had it on Blogspot, and their export function just wouldn't work. I'd run it over and over, tried many different angles, different browsers, and different setups, and nothing. It always run into an error in the middle. So I was about just thought I could never export it. And then finally found the solution by this special plugin, and it makes it run better. So I picked the domain name Arise from the Dust. So Arise from the Dust dot com, and those that that language comes from Lehi in his counsel to his sons where he tells them arise from the dust but he's really quoting Isaiah 52 which has this beautiful passage about the need to um, to rise from the dust and uh, that's I'll explain in a moment why I, why I picked that but that's the domain name I've got arise from the dust dot com and I've been able to transfer the whole website of Mormonity, where I've been blogging you know, a couple thousand blog posts from since 2004 for all these years about what LDS or Latter-day Saint related matters. I was able to get them successfully imported. So the comments, good and bad, some very ugly, uh, that I'm still allowed to live. I've been very generous, I feel, allowing negative comments to persist. But but I've allowed the comments and the blog posts are, are all there. And uh, finally up. So, but it's with a new theme, new new approach. And there's still some some bugs I'm working on in terms of all the categories and other, a few other things. Are going to take some time, but that's where I'm blogging now when it comes to Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saint matters. Arisingthedust.com. Uh, yeah, and I'll, uh, alongside your LDS website and your. Um Alter page on the Interpreter Foundation website, uh, which everyone should totally check out because Interpreter is awesome. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a contributing editor. <laughs> um, I'll also okay. include the uh, link to your uh, blog as well because it has a lot of very interesting material as well. Like um, you have a lot of very good stuff on your website, but you've also been spending a lot more time in recent years on the uh, blog. So everyone should check that one out as well. So I think that kind of is like a, allows for like an organic uh, flow into the particular topic we'll be discussing today. Um, so if you want to take it from there. Sure, sure. Well, the, the, the story here, uh, my, my, my journey in this Arise in the Dust theme began very unintentionally. Uh, there, was a, there was an article written by a relatively popular pseudo-anonymous a uh, Latter-day Saint who uh, says that he's got a PhD in, in some highfalutin areas. Um, and this Latter-day Saint skeptic, who's you know, maybe not exactly convinced that much about the church is actually true, wrote that, you know, the whole Book of Mormon uh, story about Lehi's trail and Nahum and all these things that some of us see as just such really interesting evidences for Book of Mormon authenticity argued that, you know, none of that really counts as very good evidence. Uh, it's, all, it's all weak and doesn't give a lot of details, and uh, enough, enough details to really be convincing. It went on a big long article about why we really shouldn't take it seriously. And one of the points he made was that you know, the book of Nephi, or Nephi's writings, show that he is talking about the Exodus. He was viewing his journey as being a parallel to the Exodus, and, and he's making references to Moses and the Exodus. For example, First Nephi chapter 4, verse 2 was cited, and this is where Moses or Nephi is telling his brothers that, come on, guys, we need to be strong like Moses and have you know, faith like Moses. And he said, well, this shows that, that um, Nephi thought the whole Exodus thing had happened. And we know now, thanks to brilliant modern scholarship, that there was no such thing as the Exodus. This was all a story concocted after the exile as this tiny Jewish tribe tried to find some ways to add some grandeur to their, to their past which really is a very unfortunate way of viewing that. But he said, so, you know, we know the Exodus didn't really happen, and therefore any references in the Book of Mormon to the Exodus are clearly anachronistic and just proves you know, the Book of Mormon is not true. Well, okay, so I thought, that's, I got I to gotta respond to that. I can't just let that sit. So I started digging in and started, you know, responding to some of the statements this guy made about, oh, well, you know, 
Lehi's trail couldn't have happened, and that, that turned into a, a, a couple of part, a two part article that I ended up submitting to. The, first, I published it in my Mormonity blog, but then I said, well, maybe there's something here. I'll tr try and see if the interpreter might be interested. Sent it there, and it became a two part series uh, under the name Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor uh, Dream Coat. And that, uh, you know, kind of, I like I liked the title, had some fun with it, but I responded to all those things. But while I was responding to, and, and so there are some good answers, by the way, to the whole charge of the Exodus. One of the things I cited, I'll just show this, I've got the book handy. Uh, I love this author, he's an Orthodox Jewish scholar, his name is Joshua Berman. And this is, is uh, yeah, his recent book, Ani Ma'amin, so I believe in Hebrew. and. It's what they believe and why. And he's writing to fellow Jews, but he could just as well be writing to, to Latter-day Saints because he talks about things like, well, how do you handle the documentary hypothesis? How do you handle biblical scholarship saying the Exodus didn't happen? How do you handle this and that? And, and a lot of the issues he addresses are ones we have as core issues affecting Latter-day Saint um, communities. So he has, it was just a wonderful chapter he wrote uh, that was really originally an article he published on some of the really interesting evidences for the reality of the Exodus and why and, Jews don't have to be embarrassed about that. And not to like interrupt you, but like for those who may be uh, interested, uh, that's an excellent book, and I would suggest it, uh, especially his discussion of the documentary hypothesis and how the evidence for it is sometimes exaggerated. But at the same time, also another scholar would be Hofmeier. His books, Israel in Egypt and Israel in Sinai. Yes. And for those who or into YouTube, David Falk, who has a PhD from uh, Egyptology from Liverpool, he's done a lot of excellent work as well on Exodus as well. He runs the Exodus and the Bible YouTube channel, and he's done a lot of work as well as some published articles on uh, the historicity of Exodus and the chronology of Exodus as well. So That's David Falk. Uh, F-A-L-K. F-A-L-K, okay. Great, thank you. And uh, Hofmeier's work, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I cited those also in my in my response to to the the challenges. But when in doing all this and writing that the article, one of the attacks that particular attack made about First Nephi four two raised a question that the author that the critic hadn't raised, but but struck me as curious. Uh, Nephi is telling his brothers, and he, he's citing this as if we all know anyone who knows the story from the Torah should know that Moses was strong, right? He says, so let's be strong like Moses. And I was sitting here thinking, wait a second. All I remember about strength, I try to remember all the cases of strength in the, in the, in the Torah. And I actually went and, and searched all the uses of the word strong or strength or powerful to try to find out. I just don't remember. I don't remember Moses being called strong. And in fact, one of the images that stuck in my mind was at, at, where there, was, there was a battle where they have to have two guys helping to hold his arms up so he can hold this staff, this stick up in the air. Well, that doesn't sound like somebody who's really all that buff and strong. You need two people to help him hold up, what's maybe five pound stick? I mean, it's a long time, yes, but uh, I didn't come away with the idea of physical strength as one of Moses' characteristics. So where do they get this? And Nephi cites it like it's common knowledge. Um, as I, was, as I was pondering that and wondering about that, I ran into a... Um, I ran into I ran into a passage in actually excuse me this, there's one more step to this whole process. Um, I was reading in the book of Moses and saw something uh, very interesting. It's a long story, but I ended up finding it running into almost by accident a paper by Noel Reynolds called the Brass Plates of Brass Plates of of, uh, of, of Moses and. The, uh, the, the idea was, uh, Noel, Reynolds, Noel Reynolds' hypothesis was that there were some similarities in the Book of Moses that, and the Book of Mormon that, that make it look like something like the Book of Moses might have been on the brass plates. And he had some really interesting evidence for that. It was a great hypothesis. And as I thought about that article, I said, wow, that's interesting. What if, what if the brass plates had something like our Book of Moses? I wonder if there is anything about strength and Moses in the Book of Moses. And so I started reading in Moses 1, and right away uh, I found a couple of references implying strength for Moses. And then I found a beautiful passage where the Lord tells Moses, I will make you stronger than many waters. 
as the Lord is telling Moses about his new mission, he is going to be stronger than many waters. And I said, wow, strength of Moses could be theoretically explained if there were a book of Moses, uh, a text like the book of Moses on the brass plates that Nephi had access to and his brothers knew about. Really interesting. And then I started wondering, well, I wonder if there might be some other parallels. And one of the ones that, that struck me as interesting was in Moses 7, a really dramatic image of, of these uh, chains of darkness that, uh, that, that, Satan, that Satan shakes. And that was part of, uh, part of my, my, my study also. And I found these interesting parallels between uh, these, these chains of darkness and the Book of, uh, Book of Mormon. And uh, that led to more things. That led to, uh, well, reading an interesting article by David Bakovoy about um, biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann, who had talked about rising from the dust. And that, uh, that article, uh, reading Walter Brueggemann's article, I, I tracked it down at BYU, got the, got the original um, copy so I could st uh, study, study it myself. That opened up a really interesting, really interesting door because this, this theme of rising from the dust, uh, as I started looking in the Book of Mormon, um, these, these elements of, from the strength of Moses, the, the chains of Satan in the, book of, in the book of Moses, and a lot of other things that all started, started looking like they were related. And much of the relationship came down to how the Book of Mormon uses Isaiah 52. There's just a couple of short verses there that, in fact, when you read, when you read these verses in English, it's really, it's really hard to see why this would be such an impressive or such a big deal. In fact, part of it is really confusing. Let me, can I just take a second to read a couple of verses here? Isaiah 52, 1 and 2. I, I, these, when you think about these verses, you'll see concepts from these are used in many ways in the Book of Mormon. It's almost like a permeating, pervasive theme from beginning to end um, involving dust and enthronement and other concepts. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from, thy, from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. This is a very hopeful passage, and we see allusions to this occurring many times, including Lehi dealing with, de dealing with his sons. And Lehi, uh, Lehi in 2 Nephi 1 and some other passages brings together multiple elements that we find in the book of Moses, like these chains of, of darkness that Satan has, um, and the issue of, of, of strength and what it means to, to enter into the covenant. Walter Brueggemann pointed out that the, and this is 1967, that the ancient theme of rising from the dust and he's building on some other work, a scholar named Vingards, who had looked at Hosea and, and found some relationships to death in the three days and also rising from the, from the grave. Um, Brueggemann pulled these things together and pointed out that there was an ancient co covenant-related concept in the, in the ancient Near East that involved rising from the dust. We're created from the dust. When we die, we fall to the dust. But that falling to the dust, or being in the dust, is also a symbol of, it's a symbol not only of death, but of spiritual death, of a broken covenant, of decay, of losing power. Whereas rising from the dust is a symbol not only of life and resurrection, but of keeping the covenant, of being blessed and endowed with power as a result of keeping that covenant, and even of political power or spiritual power in the form of enthronement. So fall to the dust, death, misery, destruction, loss of power, rise from the dust, you're keeping the covenant instead of breaking it. You're being blessed by the terms of the covenant. You're becoming enthroned. You're being clothed with, with beautiful robes and garments of the, of the priesthood or of the temple. You are entering into power. So it has all these dimensions. And David Bakavoy made a really good point that, hey, the Book of Mormon, uh, Nephi and Lehi used this in an appropriate way, talking about political power, 
that rising from the dust has political implications, and they're using it to kind of justify Nephi rule, that it should be Nephi and his descendants ruling the, 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 the kingdom, because they're the ones who have kept the covenant, they're the ones who rise from the dust. That is a very good point. But reading Brueggemann and the, the multiple dimensions he had, I came away feeling, wow, there's even more to this than just the political aspects. There are very deep covenant aspects. And we see this fa these passages, uh, references to Isaiah 52, being used multiple places in the Book of Mormon. Even calling the Book of Mormon the voice from the dust, maybe hinting at these covenant elements, that this is a book aimed at helping us to rise from the dust, keep the covenants, enter into the kingdom of God, and have all the blessings and power and so forth that comes with being part of that part of that community. The Book of Mormon is a uh, is just a, a marvelous unified text. Many different authors, but they draw upon a lot of themes that come from the ancient world, not from Joseph Smith's community. And this understanding of both the political and spiritual and covenant based aspects of rising from the dust. Uh, as far as I tell, no one had, this was not on the radar screen of, of theologians, scholars, preachers, ministers, people in Joseph's community in the 1830s. This is a new, relatively new insight that comes from the, you know, the, our last century, not just, not the 19th century. And yet the Book of Mormon is squarely in that, using these themes in the right way, catching the political nuances, but also the covenant nuances and the spiritual nuances. And this passage in Isaiah 52 is used so frequently and, and, and helps inform so many speeches, even a king of Bene, or king of Bene, the Abinadi to King Noah. Um, some of the strange answers he gives, they ask him what this, what, what this verse means and what a particular verse means. And he goes off in this long lecture that kind of meanders around before coming back. But when you see the importance of the arise from the dust theme, you see how he's building up to that as he comes and talks about well, how beautiful upon the feet are the are upon the mountains are the feet of those who are are bearing witness of Christ. The feet on the mountains is feet that have risen from the dust. They they rise and stand on the mountains on the on the throne of God. It's a, a symbol of people rising from the dust, and these things fit and inform many aspects of the Book of Mormon. It was just a fascinating journey. So it became two articles. Uh, actually, excuse me, that was a series of three articles in the in the Interpreter Journal. So they all start with the rise from the dust. But the first one explores the relationships between the Book of Moses and the Book of, and the Book of Mormon. Because as I was doing this, looking at how, hey, these uh, chains of darkness, well, they're there in the Book of Mormon in ways very similar to described in the Book of, in the Book of Moses. And this element is there. The strength of Moses seems to be there informing that. I said, I found two more besides these 33 that Noel Reynolds found. I was really excited about that. And I talked with Noel Reynolds um, and said, hey, you know, I found a couple of interesting things. And in fact, after a couple more months, I realized, oh, now there's an up to a dozen, maybe two dozen more elements, share them with Noel. He got really excited. We started digging in and going back and forth. Uh, by the time we got done doing this collaborative collaborative paper that we now published, also an interpreter, we had nearly 100 parallels, interesting, informative parallels between the Book of Moses, our little tiny Book of Moses, and we're talking about the non-biblical elements of the Book of Moses. So, of course, Genesis is going to be a parallel in both texts, but Interesting things, passages, word, word choices, references between these two texts in the Book of Mormon, and many of them in ways that suggest a one-way flow, as if the Book of Mormon is making reference to a deeper source or a more complete source, making, uh, making allusions, or in some cases, um, very clear evidence of a one-way connection, such as when Nephi uh, explains, when he's, Nephi's writing what his brothers have said, the charges his brothers make against him, when you go back and read the book of Moses, you realize Nephi is referring to a particular passage in Moses 4, where they're talking about the characteristics of Satan, and his brother, his brothers are making charges to Nephi that suggest, we need to kill you because you are Satan. You are serving Satan. The characteristics of Satan, you're, you're leading us away, you're blinding, the, you're blinding people's hearts, and so forth. All these, all these characteristics of Satan from the book of Moses, in one particular verse, we find Nephi's brothers are using against Nephi. 
And that's the kind of thing that happens when a text is informed by another text, the text that describes the characteristics of Satan. It's not the kind of thing that happens when you're just spewing off random stories and later you now go and create the Book of Moses and try to pull it all together into some kind of coherent whole. Um, that's the amazing thing about this relationship. The Book of Moses came after the Book of Mormon. And yet, the characteristics of the of the text and the illusions and these nearly 100 concepts that, that are relied upon or borrowed upon in the Book of Mormon really, in many cases, strongly suggest a one-way flow, that the Book of Mormon is drawing upon the other source, rather than the author of the Book of Moses is now plucking favorite passages out of the Book of Mormon and sticking them in that text. That's a very interesting hypothesis, and in my opinion, it adds some very significant strength to arguments both for the authenticity of the Book of Moses but also for the authenticity of the Book of Mormon at the same time, that it's giving us some insights into what might have been on those brass plates in ways that just don't make any sense if Joseph Smith is, is the author doing all of this on the fly. So very long answer here. Sorry about that, but that's oh, no, kind it's perfect. of it's perfect. background. Okay. And, and it should be noted like uh, when it comes to, say, the links between the Book of Moses and um, the Book of Mormon. The Book of Moses, of course, was worked on like 1830, 1831, thereabouts. There's no yeah. evidence that I'm aware of um, that Joseph was actually fermenting these ideas. Um, you know, the Book of Moses, even from the critic's perspective, seems to come like right. it's a novelty after the Book of Mormon was published. So right. very fact, like um, he would have to keep, if he, like from a purely naturalistic perspective, he would have to keep like these very obscure passages and the interpretation of these obscure passages in mind uh, and spe uh, put them throughout the Book of Moses. There's no right. like one single paragraph where all the Book of Moses, Book of Mormon stuff appears. It's more like right. uh, links here and like intertextuality and then the exegesis and the um, importance only comes out afterwards. Yes, so, um, yes. It's so. also related to that. Like one of the just about the first thing Joseph did, first significant one of the first significant things he did after he had completed the translation of the Book of Mormon was to go have Oliver buy a, buy a Bible for him, which is just an amazing little detail on its own, because for all these years, we, you know, we, we, we kind of assumed, okay, when Joseph got to these King James versions, he just, you know, flipped open his Bible and started reading and gave it directly as written in the King James Bible, and he could have studied the Bible all the time while he was doing the translation, but he was in an information vacuum when he was doing the, the dictation of the Book of Mormon. He had moved away from, from, uh, from, Pal from Palmyra, moved away from the Erie Canal, and was now in this place where it's just, it was just desolate, no library within uh, driving distance or writing distance in, in uh, Little Harmony, Pennsylvania. Just a total information vacuum and also apparently away from his family's Bible and he had to buy a Bible when he decided it was time to start working on the Genesis, the translation of Genesis. So he gets the Bible and then it's, you know, it's like uh, it's June of 1830 that we get Moses chapter one, the first, first version of that after the Book of Mormon is, is, has already been, been translated. He starts doing that, it's over the next year. We get Moses 8 by the end of 1831, I think. Um, it comes and coming out in bits and pieces, but the relationship between those two texts is just so surprising. And when you take the hypothesis, well, Joseph must have been drawing upon the Book of Mormon using common Book of Mormon language, it doesn't work. I, I, of course, it works as well. Like uh, he was drawn from Adam Clark or insert nineteenth century source here. Yes, yes. And then a really interesting test case too is to say, well, if Joseph's just you know, if Joseph is just trying to insert lots of references of the Book of Mormon on purpose, what about the Book of Abraham? His Book of Abraham comes later, and it's a very different story. The the, the connections are are of very much different nature. Uh, very, very little connection can be found between those two texts. Um, quite a different beast than the Book of Moses. Book of Moses really makes sense if something like it were on the brass plates. And that's that's just, a, to me, a very interesting finding. Yeah, um, and I'm, of course, Jeff will be sharing some slides, but like if you want, um, for those who are interested in, like, say, the use of the Old Testament in the Book of Mormon from a different perspective, uh, Ben McGuire has done an excellent article uh, on the use of the A, but not the B source of the David Goliath epic um, in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Um, uh, basically, Nephi's use of the Old Testament in the David Goliath, David, uh, unnamed Philistine story, is dependent upon the pre exilic source, but not the later post exilic material. Uh, and his essay is called Nephi and Goliath. 
um, which also shows like the brass plates and Nephi's use of thereof fits a pre like biblical text, if you will. So, and Ben McGuire is someone I hope to have on the podcast in the near future as well. So, good, good. Look forward to that. So, I believe that you have some slides you'll be sharing with us. Yes. Okay. Let me pull over. Let me jump over there. And oh yeah. Sorry, I forgot to do the share share screen. And there we go. Okay. So this is the this is where I ran into that puzzling statement. Let us go up. Let us be strong, like unto Moses. And there, pictured on the right, is a couple of people helping ailing, failing Moses to hold up the, the staff for the war. So that's where I was struggling. And oh, there's the title of the uh, article, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, down at the bottom. So I mentioned there were a number of articles that, um, that Noel Reynolds had. And as I started exploring these themes, I found, right away found a number more before, before I reached out to Noel Reynolds. And one of these was the relationship of chains of darkness or chains of hell that most that we have in Moses' couple of passages. And these are very uh, powerful images, like Satan with a great chain in his hand. It veiled the whole earth, face of the earth, with darkness. And the remainder were reserved in chains of darkness till the judgment of the great day. Um, as I was wondering if that might be in the Book of Mormon, I was actually disappointed because you search for the term chain of darkness, nothing. But there were parallels, and it began with 2 Nephi one twenty three, And this, this passage, chain of darkness, when you realize darkness can be translated as obscurity, that's one of the definitions of, uh, well, well, 2 Nephi one twenty three links obscurity with chains. And we have chains and obscurity in the same word, but also with the use of the word um, dust. And just looking at the Hebrew, um, I wondered if this word for dust, afar, might be related to the word for obscurity, awful, or awful. And uh, contacted a couple of people that um, know Hebrew, and they thought, well, that could be promising. There really could be something there. So that led me to wonder if there could be a wordplay here in Second Nephi one twenty three. Um, I don't want to get too much into the details. Uh, I'm going to skip that. But Second Nephi, um, this this is again the passage from 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 Isaiah. And I, I should have pointed out. I have this in red. Uh, Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down. And Today, modern readers read that and go, why would any, if, if, if the Lord wants you to rise out of the dust, well, why would he have you sit back down in it as soon as you get out? That seems like a, a real problem. But the interesting, the interesting answer is that the idea is not that you're sitting back down in the dust, but that you're sitting down on your throne. This is a reference to enthronement. So that's a really interesting concept to keep in mind. I want to just read here 2 Nephi 1.23. I'll show it in a minute, but this is Lehi. Awake, my sons, put on the armor of righteousness. So this is similar to awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Shake off the chains, which is like shake yourself from the dust. Shake off the chains which, with which ye are bound. And here we have what kind of chains? These are chains, Satan's chains, chains of darkness. And he tells them, come forth out of obscurity. And there's the actual word that refers to darkness, and arise from the dust. So I love this passage, 2 Nephi 1.23. Um, Awake, put on the armor, shake off the chains rather than the dust, but they're related here, and come forth out of obscurity. These chains of darkness need to be removed so you can arise from the dust. And this fits into the covenant concept. It goes on, 2 Nephi 1.20, which uh, Taylor Halverson has shown is almost like a, uh, a meme in the Book of Mormon for covenant relationships. This theme of prospering in the land is, is related to all of this. You prosper in the land by becoming enthroned and accepting the blessings of the gospel. Um, and then this awake, awake, arise from the dust. These themes are emphasized in, in Lehi's farewell speech as he tells his sons to arise from the dust, to avoid captivity. So the freedom, the rising from the dust, the breaking the bonds of death, 
being enthroned, the covenant keeping, all these themes related to the arise in the dust concept are embodied here with that, especially that final plea in verse 23, awake, put on the armor of righteousness, shake off the chains. And it's just beautifully building on Isaiah 52. It's just very powerful. And Nephi, Nephi does, does very melodic, beautiful things with Isaiah in his writings that go, again, far beyond what you're going to expect for, for any 19th century source doing it. So again, I compare that. But it turn out, turns out also, when you look at this, uh, it fits into a very nice chiasmus. Um, from second, first, second Nephi 1, starting with verse 13 to 23, the endpoints have a waking and either the sleep of hell or chains and obscurity. So the darkness, sleep, chains awake, very clear endpoint, coupled with arise from the dust as a, as a contrast. And then we go through multiple steps that we, with the rising grave soul, and then in the middle we have being warned about captivity of the people. It's the will of Satan versus the will of the Lord, and that's what it really boils down to: whose will? This is the choice you make: do you, do you get swallowed up in the grave according to the will of Satan, or do you arise in the dust, just come out of obscurity? So there's a lot going on here. Um, we find many, there's some more examples of how Isaiah 50, uh, 55, 1 and 2, or is that 52, 1 to 2, are being used by Nephi and, and others, alluded to by Jacob and Alma, and possibly more. So dust and enthronement, and I've got Walter Brueggemann's article here from Dust to Kingship, and I'm sorry, I said 1972, it was 19, 1967, it's really 72, apologize, but Here's a quote that the motifs of covenant renewal, enthronement, and resurrection cannot be kept in isolation from each other. That's all blended into this rising from the dust concept. And it does have political and theological aspects. The Book of Mormon plays on both beautifully, profoundly. And again, something you just can't do in the 19th century based on what scholarship was able to give us. Um, much more to say, and Brueggemann's article is really a good one. I don't want to get too much into that, but it helped me understand that there is more to this, these, these concepts than, than meets the eye, and there's some really cool stuff going on in the Book of Mormon. And there's Wingards, that's a 67 source I mentioned where he looks at Hosea, um, also sees a covenant theme and repentance theme built into Rising from the Dust. So these things, uh, the motifs that, that Lehi introduces associated with, with, with dust include uh, the awaking from the sleep. So of course it's repentance, it's avoiding cursing, it's choosing between light and dark, Satan's will versus your will. Uh, whose presence are you going to be in? The threat of cursing and being clothed by God and or putting on the armor of righteousness. Uh, all building on that Isaiah Isaiah 52. And again, thanks to David Bakavoy for helping call my attention to Brueggemann's work. Um, there's a lot more going on here. There's structure, there's uh, large passages in the Book of Mormon that seem to build in like, a, in like an inclusio on this, on this theme. And uh, my proposal is that this passage, that, that um, Isaiah's use of these dust themes, which include licking up the dust off the feet, as part of the gathering, a theme for the gathering of Israel, that uh, these passages are being used as a key passage in Nephite religion. And here's kind of the concept of this inclusio. And it's really interesting because you read the Book of Mormon, you, as, you, as you notice this uh, licking the dust off the feet concept, it's repeated a couple of times in a way that seems, hey, really redundant. We just read this a few chapters ago. Why is that? In the Book of Mormon's world, though, this is an important tool. It's an important rhetorical tool to call attention to, to what's going on. So we have 1 Nephi 20 giving us a talk on the dust removal from the feet and enthronement and so forth. And then that's A1. And then in the middle, we have Lehi's farewell and the, the emphasis on arising from the dust. And then 2 Nephi 6, we come back and quote that same passage again, Isaiah 49, about kings licking the dust from the feet of, of scattered Israel. And 
Then we again have a reference to awake, awake, and shake yourself from the dust in 2 Nephi 8. So this is being used multiple times. It's Isaiah 52, and it's related Isaiah 49 passage. It's being used multiple times in a large chunk of text spanning parts of 1 Nephi and 2 Nephi that form an inclusio that help tell us something, that give us some explanatory power in what Nephi is doing. Uh, because he's, there's specific motifs and themes he is trying to call attention to with these repeated passages at the beginning and the end. And um, dust ends and begins, Second Nephi. Second Nephi 1 itself, rich in dust themes. You have the farewell speech of Lehi. And then Nephi concludes, telling us that he speaks as the voice of one crying from the dust. And... I like that. Um, he's woven, he's woven this, this, this dust theme in several ways in a couple of different blocks of text in his work, and it goes beyond Nephi. But these themes, just wants to be aware of, let me go back to that, just like readers to be aware, or listeners to be aware of how this theme of dust plays a significant role, even though it's not cited all over the place, but multiple, multiple sections of the Book of Mormon do this. These themes involve death and decay, chaos, destruction. The raw material of God's creations are represented by dust, rising from the dust, keeping the covenant, resurrection, receiving power and authority, enthronement, salvation. Dust, like chains of captivity, they're linked together in 2 Nephi 1.23, can be and, and must be shaken off. A lot of times we're told we've got to shake off those cords that bind you, shake, shake, off the, shake these things off. Dust can be washed off, licked off, shaken off, but it needs to be removed as a symbol of our being cleansed, purified, resurrected, keeping the covenant, moving beyond the, the chaos of the dust. And a lot of other concepts that, that we find related. Shaking, um, when, 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 the, when the chains come off, when the dust comes off, it's time to sing and rejoice. And rising, you know, the Hebrew word, I think it's pronounced chum in Isaiah 52, uh, used many, many times, means to establish, stand, ascend. And if you think about that, when the Book of Mormon is talking about rising, standing, ascending, um, we can see some relationships sitting, in authority, on a throne, is a good thing. It's not sitting back in the dust. And it goes along with putting on robes of authority. After you're, you get washed, you get anointed, the dust is off, on come the robes of power and enthronement. And also encircling. You can be encircled by chains when you're breaking the covenant and covered with dust uh, or bands. But when you are entering into the covenant, you are encircled with the arms of the Lord, with robes of the priesthood. And Nephi, uh, Hugh Nibley used to talk about how the symbol of, enter, you know, of entering to the Lord's presence is beautifully represented by uh, a covenant embrace. And like the sheik putting his, wrapping his robe around you to welcome you into, into his fold. And that's a beautiful ancient Near East concept. You know, we see these concepts used richly and profoundly and intelligently, even poetically in the Book of Mormon, that are, are still opportunities for further scholarship and investigation and wondering. And these were not understood or recognized in Joseph Smith's day. Even if he had the best Bible scholars on his technical advisory team, uh, he would not have been able to nail it the way the Book of Mormon nails it. Resurrection, exaltation, and enthronement, all related concepts here. So uh, there's a lot more you can talk about, but I just, uh, it was a great journey for me to realize that. I'm no, no Bible scholar, just poking around, reading things from some other Bible scholars, from real Bible scholars, but it really helped me be aware of beautiful images that bring together the Bible and the Book of Mormon, that link them, that show common ancient paradigms that the Book of Mormon just develops in such lovely ways and profound ways. So this theme of dust removal is one of the one of the tools of the one of the messages of the Book of Mormon is get that dust removed. Um, okay, and so King Benjamin's speech uh, employs it, you know, telling us that we're like the dust of the earth, and he himself is also of the dust, about to yield up his mortal frame. Um, these links to humility play an important role. 
But then he asked the people to enter into a covenant. The people fall to the earth. One of the things that always puzzles me about the Book of Mormon is, why is everybody falling to the earth? I mean, somebody has, you know, sees an angel, boom, they fall to the earth. Somebody has an epiphany, boom, they fall to the earth. A great speech, boom, they fall to the earth. Um, I used to wonder, was there some kind of mutation that made them just really susceptible to suddenly keeling over? I mean, just, what was going on? And it's something that would be easy to mock, of course, from our, from our critics. Everybody's falling to the earth. But when understood in a covenant concept, if, if, you've, if you are in a culture that, under, that sees um, falling, to, falling to the earth as a symbol of humility, as a symbol of having broken a covenant, as something from which you need to rise to enter into the covenant, it makes sense that people would fall to the earth to express their, their humility and see themselves as less than the dust of the earth and, and wait until being prepared to rise to enter into the covenant before the Lord. These are This may be a ritualized response to spiritual events in Nephite culture that is influenced by uh, these dust motifs being a, uh, maybe a key part of the Nephite religious paradigm. So uh, that's something that's something else to think about. One thing that really interested me was Nephi's encounter with Noah's priest. Was he asking this question? Uh, you th the, the King Noah's priests are trying to get this guy killed. So they're trying to ask the toughest trick question they can come up with, right? And what do they do? It's always puzzled me. The question they throw at him is, what does it mean when the scriptures say how beautiful upon the mountains are the, are, are the feet, etc., from Isaiah 52, 7 to 10? Why is that such a such a, a great trick question? Or why, why? And then even more puzzling, why does Abinadi give the answer that he does, that, that meanders for several chapters before it comes back and specifically addresses and, and cites this passage? Well, uh, that was something I explored in in one of the one of the papers here. But the proposal is this: if Isaiah fifty two really is a foundational part of Nephite religion, this this arise from the dust theme, as suggested by Nephi's inclusio, then the feel good of Isaiah fifty two about how beautiful upon the feet are 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 those who proclaim peace. This might seem like a rebuttal to Abinadi's message of gloom and doom. Because, hey, the Lord's saying our, our feet are beautiful. If we, you know, if we believe in God, our feet are beautiful, everything's great. And Abinadi's rambling, seemingly rambling answer really is not. If Isaiah 52 is a pivotal passage for the Nephites, um, his answer actually lays a good foundation to overthrow the priest misapplication of Isaiah 52. Because Nephi goes back and explains what the law is, what its purpose is, how we have reconciliation through the Messiah, how we need to repent and follow God, and only then can we begin rejoicing. And he explains that those whose feet will become beautiful on Mount Zion are ones who heed Isaiah 52 and shake off the dust, repent, arise, receive the grace of the Messiah, put on the beautiful garments of the Lord. Then will their feet be firmly established. They'll have cause to rejoice and sing praises to their Redeemer. So with the arise from the dust theme as a core part of Nephite religion understood and its relationship to Isaiah 52, Abinadi's answer suddenly makes sense, but he has to go back and lay a foundation. That you can't just say, hey, I'm saved, my feet are beautiful upon the mountain, God loves me, I'm just the way I am, I'm perfect. No. There's a need for all of us to repent and shake off some dust and repent to come to the Lord. And this is a message that makes them mad, but it shouldn't. It should make all of us rejoice. This is a universal message. We all have dust that is in need of shaking off, of being cleansed from. And the Book of Mormon shows us the way to do it. We need to understand the law and the covenant. We need to be reconciled through the Messiah. We repent and follow God, and then we can rejoice with those beautiful feet upon the mountain. His answer just makes wonderful sense. So, so this, to me, was interesting because... To me, to me, this gave explanatory power to this whole arise from the dust theme. Questions that were puzzling before suddenly start to make sense. Applications that were related to this arise from the dust theme that were seemed odd and rambling now look like, ah, he's on a clear trajectory, laying the foundation to get to the punchline to directly address their question. And to me, that was the kind of thing that would come from a person who was deeply imbued with that, those motifs and that knowledge and applied them step by step. 
very hard for me to conceive of Joseph Smith just rambling that off, um, staring into a hat, uh, and bringing those themes together so nicely, even if he had known what he was doing. Uh, just really interesting. Okay, there's more. There's more chiasmus to talk about. I won't go into all of this. It's a, it's a, it's a long paper, but I really was, uh, I felt blessed by just a deeper appreciation for a lot of things in the Book of Mormon, a lot of themes. I, the, the third part of the uh, Rise from the Dust articles applies these to Alma 36, which some people say is the most majestic chiasmus they've ever seen. I'm in that camp. It's just a marvelous chiasmus. Uh, but others say, oh, it's got these loose sections, it's just cherry-picking words, and there's too much slack. And it turned out that some of that slack, when you apply these motifs from, arise from the dust, you find some really beautiful balancing that we didn't realize was there before, or at least I didn't realize was there before, that to me makes a lot more sense. So I won't get into that, but Finally, I'll point out that when Christ comes and teaches his people, he's using some of these uh, dust-related themes. And you can note that when you um, consider what happens there as the people, you know, they're, 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 they're down on the ground, they arose and they stand. They're, he talks about establishing his covenant, establishing the land, which is related to the feet being established on the Mount, Mount Zion. And God will raise them up, all perhaps using that Hebrew word kum that refers to rising. And Christ here is, has, has, been, has, has risen for us. Uh, and tells us to break into joy. He tells us then awake again, awake again, and put on thy strength. There's again that reference to Isaiah 52, and shake thyself from the dust. Arise, sit down. Um, Christ is using this, and how beautiful are the feet. Also, he's bringing these things together in his teachings, as he's telling us, bringing us into the covenant, gathering Israel, putting them, bringing them literally into the covenant, that they might be prepared to rise from the dust as he has risen. And Moroni's closing words, Awake and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem, put on the beautiful garments. He's applying this and understands that these, of course, relate to covenants, which the Father has made into you and tells us, come unto Christ and be perfected in him, be perfect in Christ. The closing punchline of the Book of Mormon, the, the conclusion, just like the Book of Mormon with Nephi starts with this emphasis on the rise from the dust thing, the Book of Mormon ends with it. The Book of Mormon, the voice from the dust, tells us to, ar ar tells us to arise from the dust, awake, put on the beautiful garments, get the blessings of the temple, the blessings of the covenant, that uh, we will not be scattered, but be perfected in Christ. And that's what the Book of Mormon is about. It is the most Christ-oriented book. It is focused, laser-focused, on the covenants we make with Christ to bring us into his presence that we might arise from the dust with, with the Savior. And I find that theme just pervasive in the Book of Mormon. And I was really, I was, I felt really blessed to to explore that and to see those things opened up. And there was so much more to dig into still, but that's what got me all excited about Arise from the Dust, hence the name of the, the blog and so forth. But I hope readers will look at those things and do some of their own investigation. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks. That was a very informative. Uh, and as someone who really enjoys, like, say, the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament and the use of the Bible in the Book of Mormon, um, I really enjoyed your tree papers and even enjoyed this kind of um, brief overview of your work. So uh, everyone should definitely uh, check it out. Um, just while you were going through it, like, there's a few things that come to mind, and uh, feel free to like uh, add some comments as well. But um, your discussion about like say light motifs and other things—it kind of reminds me of a lot of work of a mutual friend of ours as well, Matthew Bowen from uh, BYU and Wacky, who's yes. done except, and I'm sure you agree with me, like perhaps the best work on the on the Masticon in the Book of Mormon. In That's incredible. Decades. But um, I'm not I'm not saying it's one to one equivalent, but it does remind me like he's working on shows like not only is there like valid etymologies, but like there's word plays involved on these Egyptian Semitic etymologies on an exegetical level and a parallel parallelism level as well, like Jershon inheritance, Zarahemna, Cedars, uh, compassion, um, so forth. So um, yeah, for those who may want more, more into like say the literary, um, the complex literary character of the Book of Mormon uh, and how it's not just a complex document, but it's a complex document that's evidence of a translated text. Of course, it has three articles on this, but other works as well, including Matt Bowen's articles as well on these topics as well. Um, that just kind of came to mind while uh, you were going to go and through this kind of was reminded of Matt's uh, excellent work on, and I'm sure you would agree with me as well. His work is excellent on that. Yes, side. yes, yes. He uh, he is, and he's 
written so much. I mean, I've, I've bought his whole book, Name is Keyword, Excellent. which is amazing, amazing collection of, of, of essays, just adding a huge understanding to the Book of Mormon. It's been sitting in front of us all these years but to, to look back at what the likely Hebrew was and realize, oh my goodness, there are very, there's very strong evidence of subtle but, but powerful, pervasive, and artfully used word plays when you consider what the original language may have been of, the, of, the, of these speakers that just defies, just defies, it. So you, you can get some of this by accident occasionally, but almost every, everywhere you go is just loaded with, with word plays that he and others have been finding. And I just so appreciate uh, Brother Bowen's work, yeah. Dr. Bowen's work. Yeah, uh, because I remember like reading a number of years ago, like uh, David Wright, who I'm sure you've heard of uh, from Brandeis. He's probably one of the better critics of the Book of Mormon out there. You know, um, he's well educated. He once had a post on ZLMB years ago saying, like, statistically, it's possible like some of the names in the Book of Mormon can be explained through just like uh, sheer guesswork and knowledge of the Bible. You know, basically, you know, text is structured or fallacy, and that may be true to a point. You know, like if you have two hundred unique names, it's possible you could have like one or two or three that. Could be, um, could have like a valid semantic etymology, or like could even be attested years later. You know, statistically, I'm sure that could be the case. But like, it's not just a case of a valid etymology, or it's also a valid word based on an Egyptian or semantic language uh, language uh, text. Yes. And of course, Joseph did not know Hebrew until he learned it uh, with other Latter Day Saints, with Joshua Seishas. And of course, this was before like he encountered Sidney Rigdon, who did know the Bible pretty well, and so forth. So. And of course, there's no similar word plays in, say, View of the Hebrews, the King James, or the King James Apocrypha, or even most recently, one of the most proposed ones from like MHA, only a few weeks ago, the writings of uh, Jane Lead, <laughs> a uh, 17th century um, visionary from uh, Europe. Um, mm. um, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I kind of joked with Stephen Smoot when he was telling me about this presentation. Next year, when I'm in Utah, hopefully, I'll give a presentation on the use and influence of No Webster's 28 Dictionary on the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Some competition for your Walt Whitman one, by the way. <laughs> but uh, as, I, as I said, like this presentation, a lot of other work, especially in the last 20, 30 years, has shown there's a complexity to the Book of Mormon. I'm sure you would agree that it's not only a complex text, but it's a complex text that can only really be explained if it's a translation of an ancient document. Uh, I'm sure you would agree. It's like yes. uh, I was reading a book, which um, re recently reading a book by someone from Kerm, uh, Breaking the Mormon Code by uh, Matthew Paulson, oh. who uh, really dislikes Dan Peterson and Stephen Ricks. But he basically said, like, uh, the chiasmus in the Book of Mormon, there is chiasmus in the Book of Mormon, contra Dan Vogel, but it's so structured and so complex in comparison to the Bible, it must be like evidence of a 19th century or. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Um, I, oh. if, if you go on my blog and you type in uh, Chiasmus in the Book of Mormon, I actually think I quote him on that. But if not, let, I'll, I'll share the uh, references. But it's damned if you do and damned if you don't, because we're told, well, you know, uh, Welsh and Lindsay and all those you know, who harp on Chiasmus, it, it's basically like hickory dickory dog. It's not, it's not real. It's not intentional. And then you have some other people who were saying it may be intentional, but it can be easily explained like Robert Bowman. And then you have Paulson saying, oh, it's more complex than the uh, King James Bible, at least. So Joseph must have fudged it, <laughs> you know, um, so. You can but, always come up with that conclusion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no. Um, so, and also you mentioned David Bakafai. Uh, Bakafai actually had a very good book with late John Trattinus, who was also one of the best Book of Mormon scholars. Uh, Testaments, links between the Hebrew Bible and the Book of Mormon. So if someone wants more like links between the Old Testament and the uh, Book of Mormon, that was a very good book as well. It's, I think it's out of print, but I do know Book of Mormon Central has some of the chapters as PDFs online, so that would be a good research. And the, the title again? Uh, Testaments, links between the oh, oh, right. Bible and Book of Mormon. Yes, I've got that. Yeah, okay. from 2003. But I believe Book of Mormon Central has at least Trentness's article chapters on that book scanned as PDFs. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Good to um, know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I think like one issue though will be coming up, and hopefully I'm not putting you on the spot, but like, um, some of the material you were mentioning from Isaiah, of course, comes from Second Isaiah, you know, oh, as yes. it's often called. Um, and of course, like scholars tend to agree, but um, even like very liberal scholars, most of chapters 2 to 39, with the exception of maybe 24 to 27, was written at least by Isaiah of Jerusalem. And of course, chapter 1 may be written 
uh, like a, uh, followers of Isaiah may not be original. Even conservatives are open to that. And it's, I think it's pretty uh, interesting that the Book of Mormon doesn't actually begin with Isaiah 1. It starts, the earliest is actually Isaiah 2. But of course, as you know, they're one of the uh, relatively speaking better criticisms, uh, because there's a lot of scholarship one could appeal to, you, at least superficially, to support this, is Isaiah 40 to 45 was written contemporary with the exile by second Isaiah. And 56 to 66, it may have been written by the same second Isaiah, or it may be written by another person under the name of, um, who was not, of course, Isaiah of Jerusalem, 56 to 66, third or trito Isaiah. Right. Now, there's a debate as to whether there's a verse in the uh, Book of Mormon from Jacob that references or alludes to trito Isaiah, but that's a pretty complex topic. But of course, there's no question, the Book of Mormon does quote directly and indirectly through intertext, reality, and so forth. Yes. portions or chapters of second Isaiah. I think that yeah. you can't argue against that. I know, absolutely Isaiah 52 is absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And of course, it's not simply a quote, it's like an, an exegesis Heather. of that afterwards. Tense is used, yes. So yes. now there's been various proposals. My friend Blake Osler, uh, in light of the expansion theory, believe that shows us with adding or expanding to the text of the Book of Mormon. Um, personally, as much as I like Blake, I think I don't think that holds up. Um, but if he ever disagrees and wants to come on and defend that thesis, um, I'd love to have that, but uh, my own personal view is like the Book of Mormon. If you take it as seriously as a historical document, you would have to concede at least portions of what's called Second Isaiah was available to Lehi at all, and would have been original to the brass plates at least. So, um, not to put you on the spot, but like, um, what's your take, if you will, on the Second Isaiah? Yeah, well, and it's not just Latter Day Saints, you know, trying to argue that desperately to help defend the Book of Mormon. There, there's there are quite a number of, of scholars who have pointed out, I think, in some cases, made a very strong case that the arguments being used for the for Second Isaiah, Isaiah being a late addition from a from a second person, are are, are not valid. And there, it is it's certainly possible that there can be. Um, some passages, I mean, referring to Cyrus, for example, that are that theoretically could have been a later insertion. I'm not saying that they necessarily are, but to take those entire blocks of books and say, well, we, we, we think these because this style is a little different or the topic has shifted or this or that element, uh, the arguments that are used are, are far from ironclad, and there's some very good, I find compelling arguments to, to exceed the integrity of much of the material that is assigned to Second Isaiah with with First Isaiah, and I do go over those arguments, give some sources that, that readers can go to. I, I summarize some of the arguments, give the sources in in my um, Arise from the Dust theme, and also another at least one other article on uh, on the Interpretive Foundation as well as on my blog. So I'd be happy to provide some specific references. I mean, maybe I should do that with a. I am doing a follow up post on just my kind of journey with the Arise from the Dust theme that I'll be posting on my blog. Um, shortly, and I'll add a couple links there, or a couple more references of people to review. But to me, the bottom line is uh, there's certainly an argument that can be made, but there are, I feel, reasonable, strong arguments from good scholars saying that that is a, a premature conclusion, and there's good evidence to see integrity in the works of Isaiah, at least for first and second Isaiah. Uh, the tertio Isaiah, the third Isaiah it might be more difficult, but the Book of Mormon. It is, again, questionable if the Book of Mormon really does use anything that's from, from 3rd Isaiah. But uh, I'm very comfortable with considering, given what, well, yeah, as Latter-day Saints, we should be able to recognize at some point, we've got to go back to the scholars and say, guys, you're missing some of the most important evidence about the dating of 2nd Isaiah. It's right here in, in, uh, in, in the Book of Mormon. So please consider that as a very legitimate, important source that's been neglected. Yeah, and uh, just on the, uh, there are some scholars who, although they would believe in multiple authorship of Isaiah, uh, seems to believe that at least portions of what's called Second Isaiah would have been actually part of the Proto-Isaiah corpus. Um, sure. yeah. uh, Margaret Barker, um, now, in some LDS tend to like think, uh, the, you know, uh, she's infallible. Um, I think she's kind of, um, she's hit and miss, I'll, especially her stuff on Mary, I think is uh, pretty poor, but some of her earlier stuff on Second of God stuff and uh, the Old Testament cult, temple cult is pretty solid. But be that as it may, um, she actually had an essay that was published in the Journal of the Study of the Old Testament. So it's a peer-reviewed source called Hezekiah's Bile, and it's on her website, uh, the original setting of the fourth servant's son on margaretbarker.com. It's only seven pages. But she basically argues that Isaiah 52 to 53, uh, the so-called fourth servant uh, text, 
which does appear in the Book of Mormon, um, is actually uh, part of the what's called the proto Isaiah corpus, and its original setting is Hezekiah's illness, which we read about in Isaiah 36 to 39 and 2 Kings, I believe, 18 to 20 off the top of my head. So, um, e e even among some scholars who believe, yes, you know, there is like a second Isaiah, there's a third Isaiah, not the entire, not all that corpus though is original to the exilic period or the post exilic period, but some of it could actually be original or at least uh, has traditions going back to the pre exilic period yes, as well. Yes. But yeah, uh, I try to ask that. And also Dan Ellsworth, who's a Latter-day Saint, he sometimes publishes it on Public Square and a few other places. Uh, he's actually working, I believe, on a website addressing the presuppositions behind 2nd and 3rd Isaiah, as well as addressing some of the uh, topics as well with respect to 2nd and 3rd Isaiah and its use in the uh, Book of Mormon. Oh, so something to, look forward, uh, something to look forward to. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I try not to ask that because, of course, like someone maybe skeptical or even like an inquirer, you know, will ask, well, you know, oh, this is really cool, but like, well, with the a priori assumption, second eye's eye is exilic or post exilic, uh, it, it, it might not bode well for like a, a lot of the historicity uh, of the Book of Mormon. Um, but yeah. uh, so I try to ask, yeah, I uh, appreciate your uh, Yeah, no, that's a leg legitimate question, certainly. Yeah, because especially, like, it's not a crackpot position. I mean, like, if one has a naturalistic worldview, it would make sense that at least portions of Isaiah would be um, exilic or post-exilic. Um, I know it's a minority perspective amongst even some LDS, but I actually do believe Isaiah knew about a future singular Messiah, because if you read Isaiah 52 and 53 carefully, that servant-servant figure is actually distinguished from natural Israel. So it's, a, so it's not Israel as a corporate entity, but he also dies, and he's dead. He's actually a... A sacrifice that makes people righteous and that kind of fits a lot of mm. the um abinadized interpretation of the book of mormon and also the christianized interpretation as well that we find in new testament and even in the uh traditional latter-day saint perspective as well so mm. have you written about that uh, a bit here and there i hope to uh, yeah. i was going to have a debate with a ex lds who's now an atheist uh anthony biller but i think he pulled out once he found out i was an a some randomer um um so uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, I might write about it in the near future uh, because I yeah, do have interest in crystallology. Please do, please do. Yeah, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's something to uh, look. Um, I'll put on the uh, to do list sometime. Um, but yeah, so um, with that, um, any other comments or any other um, uh, references uh, you'd like to share? Um, for instance, are you, apart from like uh, your blog, are you working on any article that you hope to you publish soon or any other project at the moment? Uh, I've got a number of book reviews. One, well, one's already written. I need to revise it. And a uh, bunch of uh, really interesting things I've uh, been reading lately, including working doing a little review on things I learned from, that, from this book, Ani, Ani Ma Amin, which I find just really fascinating. Um, David Deutsch has got a book, The Beginning of Infinity, which is really intriguing to me. I, I love some of the interplay between uh, science and, and religion. And even, even though a lot of the people writing about science tend to dismiss religion and make a lot of really uh, unfortunate simplifications and treat it in a very superficial way, still many times there's great things they, they, they point out uh, along the way and things we can learn from. So... Um, a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of things going on, but uh, I I didn't mention my sort of my main hobby these days is working as a co-editor for the journal uh, of of interpreter in the journal of Latter Day Saint Faith and Scholarship, which is taking a lot more time than I had anticipated in my free time. So a little less blogging and more editing work is going on, but. It is a wonderful experience. There are some really interesting things that have been published recently that people might have missed and I think need need more attention, including some from you know, people like Matthew Bowen. But there's been some really cool finds that keep adding new insights. Just one dimension is the whole issue of Shazer in the Arabian Peninsula, Warren Aston. Um, every time Every time people go out to the Arabian Peninsula and start doing some groundwork, interesting things seem to happen. And he went there to see what would happen if somebody tried to follow the Book of Mormon directions that Nephi gives from going to Shazer. And it turns out oh, it's really intricate details that is enough so that we have to add Shazer up there with Nahum and Bountiful and the River Laman Valley Lemuel, as he, he calls it now, the fourth pillar of the Arabian Peninsula. And I think it's a valid claim that 
we have something really incredible. And just, just as a tiny piece, when they, when they wrap up their time in, in, in uh, the valley of, 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 by the river Lehman, Valley of Lemuel, it says they, they pack up their stuff and they walk across the river. They cross the river and start going nearly south, southwest. Well, there's really one key site along that river of Lehman area that makes sense as a campground. Uh, there's this nice big kind of uh, space on the north side of the river, kind of in the middle of the length of the river, and that would be the logical setting for a, a, a campsite with, with a big group of people, a significant group of people. And if you were camping there and now you wanted to start continuing your journey somewhere south, you can you would literally pack up, you can walk across the River Layman. This was not like Mississippi River. You just walk across the River Layman, and then there happens to be a break in the wall right there. There's a new wadi that you can access by simply walking across the river, and it's there. And you can see it on Google Earth. And now you can go south, southeast, and four days' journey by camel gets you to a beautiful candidate for Shazer that has a hunting area, this mountain with hunting, known for hunting of ibex, other animals, that just fits beautifully with what Nephi tells us. It's a subtle detail, but there it is. This is not the kind of stuff that, not the kind of coincidences that, that happen when you're just spewing random details out of a hat, having no idea what you're talking about. I mean, grab some, grab some friends of yours and have them dictate how you'd get across from one side of Tasmania to the other. Are you going across swamps, Alps? What? Are you swinging from trees? How do you do that? Nobody knows about Tasmania that I know of, you know, personally, unless you've been there, or Australian. But if you are able to imagine looking into a hat, spewing out a text that gives you accurate details of how to move from position A to position B of Tasmania, right down to the details of walking across the stream, and there's the opening in this large granite wall that lets you go south-southwest, I, that's getting a bit bizarre. That's pretty interesting. I think we need to spend some more time thinking about what the Arabian Peninsula tells us about the Book of Mormon. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like, you've done very good work on your website and with Interpreter on the Arabian Peninsula stuff. Warren Aston, and for those who may not have heard of him, he's done, like, a lot of very good work as well. Uh, he he wrote a book in 1984, Lehi, um, uh, Lee, was it? Uh, Lehi's, uh, in the Footsteps of Lehi, I in think. In the Footsteps of Lehi, yes. And yeah. then a few years ago, in an electronic format, um, Lehi and Saraya in Arabia. And yes. he's a number of er interpreter articles as well. But it's rather interesting, like, uh, you mentioned Chaser, like, and Matt Bone. He's at MASH, um, because he's brilliant. He actually has an article on the etymology of Chaser and how it fits the, um, I believe he proposes it means gazelle, because gazelles would be in around uh, that area as well. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, like, it's not a pre existing name, it's a name introduced in the passive so it's something that they gave to the place yeah. which kind of fits as well um i love the historicity as well of the text and the wordplay as well potentially in like the geography and um yeah animals in the area as well so it's really cool stuff and also like just one other article for those who maybe uh, want to delve more into like the arabian peninsula geography because i think both myself uh we both would agree like if it's not the, it's one of the best evidences for the historicity uh, taken as a whole because there's so much conversions. Uh, Neil Rapoli's article from a couple months ago on Ishmael in yes. the burial site near Nahum, how it's been attested as a Semitic name. And not that Neil says it's necessarily Book of Mormon Ishmael, but it's consistent with, in terms of the dating, in terms of the etymology and so forth, with an Ishmael who's buried in the Nahum area as well. Which, of course, also shows it's a pre-existing burial place, and unlike the other places in the Book of Mormon, it's introduced in the, um, not, not the active vice, like like Shazer and Bountiful, but the passive, right, the pre-existing right. place name, of course. Readers might also be interested to know that we have we have two pretty interesting, compelling in a way, uh, candidates for Bountiful. I mean, Warren Aston's Wadi, Wadi Saik and Kar Kar Fote have gotten the vast majority of attention, and I, I'm a, certainly a very big fan of that, but, but George Potter just published an interpreter, um, a really interesting article about Kororri, which is not far, a number of miles away, but it is a whole different ecosystem, or a whole different section, that also deserves some attention, and it has some unique advantages in his proposals. So I, I think we have uh, a very interesting situation with two candidates that can make a both a strong case for Bountiful. There shouldn't be any if Joseph Smith were making this up. 
Yeah, especially because it's actually uh, bountiful, even as late as 2003, in one book I read, um, years ago by XLDS is now an atheist, basically, and there's no bountiful, there's no River Lehman. But also, just speaking of uh, Potter as well as Wellington, uh, Lee in the Wilderness um, came out. Yeah, it's a wonderful year. book. Uh, what I also like is, like, they wrote about Shazer at a time when it was still, like, in its infancy in terms of the scholarship on it, so uh, that was really cool as well. So, yeah. And, of course, like, when it comes to Mesoamerica, the works of the late John L. Sorensen and Brad Garner and so forth. Um, yes. Uh, for the uh, Mesoamerican saying, which I hold to you and Jeff holds to you, and I think um, is much more consistent with the text than some of the uh, proposed theories out there. Uh, not that we're dogmatic about it, but um, it just kind of fits the uh, culture of the Book of Mormon much better than that. So, uh, yeah. Jeff... Um, I, as I said, like, I greatly appreciate you coming on. Um, and Thank as you. I said, like, uh, on behalf of like loads of people, especially my generation, really appreciate the awesome work you've done and continue to do when it comes to apologetics, uh, the scriptures of the church, the doctrine of the church, whether the Book of Mormon or the Bible or the Book of Abraham and all the, all that fun stuff. So, like, um, you know, especially for me, like, um, as I said, you're the first LDS apologist I came across. Uh, your evidence in this page kind of made me realize there could be some of this Book of Mormon after all. You know, so, like, at least personally for me, but on behalf of others as well, really appreciate the excellent work you've done over the years. And of course, again, really appreciate you coming on to this podcast. Hopefully we'll have you on again in the near future if you ever want to. Sure, my honor. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you and the wonderful work you're doing. And I'm also glad to know that there was one person out there who read some of my stuff. So thank you. I, I've always <laughs> heard a rumor that there was somebody. So now I know who it was. Excellent. <laughs> well, uh, with that, again, really appreciate it. And um, hopefully listeners will check out his uh, articles and his website and his blog. Um, definitely bookmark them. Um, and I said, hopefully next week we will have uh, my friends uh, Brian Hales and uh, Craig Foster again on to discuss Mormon fundamentalism and Great issues. Great um, Hopefully that will be like a part of a multi-series uh, as well because it's always a controversial but interesting topic. Um, a lot of contemporary currency, again, recently with uh, the media who seems to have this kind of a fascination with uh, dunking on us. Um, first they had the Under the Banner Heaven uh, nonsense and now they have this and then they have another TV series as well. Um, so, you know, if anti catholicism is the last acceptable bigotry in the American world, I think anti-Mormonism is a close second. But um, yes. something to look, for, look forward to. But again, like uh, Jeff, um, really informative presentation. I hope others. Thank you. Uh, I hope others will take it to heart and kind of see there could actually be something to this Book of Mormon that's beyond like Joseph and or insert whoever you believe was behind it, like yeah. even the Spalding theory origins. Um, it, 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 it could actually be it could actually be what it claims to be a translation of an ancient text, you know. <laughs> and it's and it's a beautiful text. It, it, there are if you just just the other day when you when you step back and pay attention to the words and the setting and what's happening. There are just some moments there that just are overwhelming when you realize the, the, the poignancy and the, the depth and the, there's just a lot of passion and love for, for, for Christ and for our own spiritual well-being that's been cooked into that, into that text that deserves a lot more attention than, it's, than, than we give it. Yeah, I mean, uh, so like, uh, if anything, hopefully it will lead to people actually read it or reread it, but some, uh, at least take it seriously as, as to what it claims to be. Take it seriously. As opposed to give it a short shrift. Um, yes. You know, I, I believe it's Terrell Givens, uh, and actually I believe it was Thomas O.D., but Terrell is actually repeated. The Book of Mormon is the type of book where you don't have to read it to actually have a uh, opinion knowledge. Right, right. <laughs> and hopefully we can actually help uh, curve that even a small bit. So uh, again, Jeff, greatly appreciate it. And hopefully Thank you. Again. Thanks so much.